Welcome back to another episode of the Westerns for Life podcast with Dan from Dan's Movie Cave, Carlos from Eastwood for Life fan, and Jeff, 101 Brunson. Hi there guys, so we are back again for another Westerns for Life podcast episode and it's uh, episode two. Uh, the first episode obviously we chose The Magnificent Seven which was Jeff's uh, choice. Uh, this time around it's uh, my choice and for this review I've chosen the uh, Sergio Corbucci Spaghetti Western from 1968. Starring Franco Nero, the mercenary. So this is a Sergio Corbucci spaghetti western, and uh, the second out of three collaboration with Franco Nero. He did make a, another spaghetti western with Corbucci in 1970 with uh, Componeros. But the mercenary is a Mexican Revolution spaghetti western, uh, sometimes also known as a Zapata Western. The plot. Basically, Franco Nero, he plays a hired mercenary, uh, a Polish mercenary by the name of Sergei Kalowski. And great shot there. And basically, he is a man for hire and uh, a Mexican peasant played by Tony Masanti. And uh, yeah, there is Tony Masanti. And his clown costume. <laughs> and, and basically, he hires uh, Kalowski's services to making him a revolutionary leader for Mexico. And in the process, uh, he is a wanted man because he does take over a mine owned by uh, Colonel uh, Garcia, played by Eduardo Fajardo. And then, uh, as with most spaghetti westerns, you get double crossings and uh, Masanti's character became becomes a, a wanted man across Mexico and the American border the characters so guys uh yeah mainly uh, the first lead is franco nero uh who plays so so guy kalowski uh what do you guys think of uh, the character played by franco nero in this movie yeah. yeah, so you want to go on that, Dan, or uh, me? Um, yeah, Franco Nero, I think, um, yeah, Franco Nero is awesome, and he's been in uh, quite a few spaghetti westerns, as you mentioned, he did three with uh, his director, Sergio Corbucci. Obviously, the most famous one is uh, Django from 1966, which was two years before this, but um, I think this one is, you know, just as well as, you know, also as it's one of his... Um, Counts, I should say, also counts as one of his, you know, great roles in spaghetti westerns uh, as uh, Sergei Kowalski, the Polak. Uh, and it's also notable for this one, uh, as opposed to Django, uh, in the English dub, uh, it's actually this time Franco Nero doing his own voice uh, in this one, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to Django where he was dubbed by somebody else. Uh, and I think uh, they, they should redo Django with his voice, because I think his voice is absolutely uh, wonderful. I think it works very well for the characters that he plays. He also dubs himself in uh, um, Companeros as well. Um, and I think the voice works very well. I think uh, his English is actually you know, pretty good. And uh, I actually think, yeah, as a lead, um, reminiscent slightly of Clint Eastwood in certain films, especially in Django, where they sort of made him up to be a Clint Eastwood sort of, I guess, double gang or look like whatever. Um, also, a lot of people would say he looks a lot like Terrence Hill, but there's a story to that because Terrence Hill was actually hard because he looked so much like Franco Nero. Um, but no, Franco Nero, I think, is a fantastic leader in the Spaghetti Westerns. He does a great job in uh, this film. And he's certainly one of the uh, one of my favorite sort of movie cowboys, outlaws. So I, I love Franco Nero. 
what do you think, uh, Franco Nero down? Yeah, I do like Franco Nero. This particular role with him in, as I was saying you uh, beforehand, Jeff, I wasn't that taken by this film originally. Um, I think a lot of that was to do with Franco Nero's character being very different to Django because in this film he plays a real greedy, selfish arsehole, to be honest, mm. which, he, uh, you know, the character arc develops throughout towards the end. But um, re-watching this this morning before this podcast, um, I grew to really like the character and appreciate his pristine kind of look the way he strategically plans out everything. He's not just one step, he's several steps ahead of everyone else. Um, and, you know, he looks cool. There's some great shots of him. Um, just one of them characters that you look at and think is very effortless, um, you know, on screen. He doesn't do a lot, does he? But he's the mastermind. And, yeah, he's grown on me. That's kind of what I think of Nero. And I, I will sort of acknowledge what you said Jeff about his voice because I absolutely really appreciated his voice I wasn't sure originally if it was him but looking it up today I thought you know what that just works so much better his English he's, he's just got a real nice classy flow to it mm. so that's what I think of him as the Pollock yeah I mean uh, he's a completely different character to what he is on Django obviously yeah, totally. with that headline there that's you can yeah. tell what his actions are he's just a man for hire and you're right danny he's a complete bastard and arsehole in this because uh he's in it for greed and uh obviously when he's at the services of uh paco Ram ramon's uh, gang um he kind of abuses it like he's getting well overpaid and he's been well treated you know he wants all the luxuries to go with it while the gang is kind of uh suffering um but what did you make of the actual look because he's got a completely different look from the django character to uh this Polish mercenary yeah, because it's a completely different look in how he's sort of he's a lot more smarter look looking he's, he's wearing a beige duster and mm. you'd have to look extra hard to realize it's the same actor so what did you think of the look um yeah, yeah. The look, as we uh, bring up a picture yeah, mm. as you can see there in the look yeah he has the uh sort of weird facial hair i don't know what sort of style of mustache slash beard whatever that is but yeah it's mm. sort of weird ass longer sideburns there mm. uh, obviously the, the, the one thing you can always tell you know with frank whatever is this you know piercing blue eyes you can always tell yeah. it's him by, by the beautiful blue eyes there uh, other than that uh, as i remove the picture um yeah he's uh yeah dressed more uh, sharply more you know he has a tie there and like i said the uh sort of the beige white uh sort of dustery thingy cape thingy i guess um i, I thought the uh, the styling form worked well um definitely with the sort of character he plays in this one uh again it's been mentioned yeah, he's a bit more of a greedy uh, bastard um more of a more, he's more of a tarantino character which i know we're gonna, we're gonna get into tarantino and, and taking influence from, from these films later on but he, he's a bit of a tarantino character he's, he wouldn't be out of place in a in a hateful eight or Django and chain for example this this character because he's, he's written that way you know, to sort of be a bastard obviously he has a bit of a uh, character development later on in the film but um yeah, I think the styling absolutely works for him. I actually like that it's a bit more of a unique look for the uh, sort of the, uh, the gunslinger, or in this case, the titular mercenary. So yeah, Dan. Dan. Yeah. Um, it took me a while to get used to originally because I do prefer in the spaghetti western the grittier, rough, unshaven type of. Uh, cowboy let's say like like an eastwood and and uh nero and django but um let's say re-watching it i thought he looked the part i mean there were certain shots of him that was just reminding me of vigo mortison with that kind of almost mm. grown up handle handlebar beer beard sorry um mm. yeah um i thought for it looked a bit different to kind of what i'm used to at that point in time yeah, I mean, I thought the character worked well, and he was 
cooler in a kind of more light-hearted way because it there are some comedic moments in this movie as well as violent moments uh, obviously him um lighting his cigar on a prostitute's bust uh yeah the uh, the match the matches yeah <laughs> a, a dead man uh, hanging uh uh, off his boots was 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 a fairly comedic sort of moment, uh, which I don't think has kind of been used in spaghetti westerns at the time. And I thought it was nice touches to his kind of cool character. So I enjoyed it because it was another sort of uh, switch in the characters that he's played um, previously into a few of those spaghetti westerns that he'd done yeah. before this movie. Um, then obviously uh, the, the second lead, Tony Masanti, who actually I didn't realize he was an American actor because he mm. does look pretty, pretty sort of European or Mexican. And uh, he played and the name sounds Italian, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I thought he was an Italian actor, obviously, the only other sort of uh, major role that I've seen uh, him in a movie is The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, where he's, yep, he's the lead role in that. Yeah. So I assumed he was uh, an Italian actor. But Masanti plays uh, Paco, Paco Roman, who's kind of a, a Mexican peasant who's actually working in this mine. Uh, and then he eventually takes over the mine much to the annoyance of uh, Colonel uh, Garcia, played by Eduardo Fajardo. But this being Masanti's only spaghetti western, and uh, I know this movie didn't perform well in Europe because uh, the role that Masanti plays is, is very similar to what Thomas Millian would have played. And uh, I thought he'd done a great job in this movie because i mean his character kind of changes throughout because you know he becomes a he's a mexican peasant and a bit of a thief but then all of a sudden he wants to become a kind of mexican uh, revolution uh, leader sort of halfway through the movie so uh, what did you yeah. guys think of his performance in in in, in this uh, in this movie jeff yeah um so yeah i did like uh, tony masanti in this um yeah we're gonna get to this as well but obviously compañeros yeah thomas Miliano in a similar sort of role which uh might as well mention this now we have compañeros which came out 70 in 1970 was sort of a, a little bit of a remake of this film sort of a retelling of this film with mm. a lot of similarities um i do prefer uh thomas Milian in this sort of role to be fair but uh, I thought Tom, uh, Tony Masanti, uh, he did a good job in it as, as Paco Roman. Uh, yeah, that was the name, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, as Paco. Um, obviously, yeah, later on, we, we showed a picture where he is uh, dressed up as the clown, uh, almost being unrecognizable. But even there, I think, uh, you know, other actors, they might have made it look silly, you know, wearing that clown costume and makeup. But with him, um, I think I think he pulled it off well. I think he pulled it off well. Um, yeah, I do like the uh, the character arc for him as well. Where at first he's not really all for the revolution, sort of midway after he meets the uh, yeah. female character of the piece, where he sort of has a change of heart and he's fighting for the cause and stuff. Um, and obviously, you know, him being uh, sort of suckered and played and tricked uh, by you know by the Pollock throughout the film, I think that. Uh, uh, makes for some comedic moments in the film, some really good comedic moments. Um, obviously, like the scene springs to mind where he's trying to work the Gatling gun, he doesn't know how to do it, and he has to ask uh, Frank Grenier to put it together for him. Um, so yeah, overall, I like Tony Masanti. Like yourself, I've only uh, I've only seen the uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage as a, as another film with him. I think he did a good job there as well. Um, I would definitely like to see some more of his films um, if they're available. I think uh, he's, he's a pretty solid actor. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's actually my favourite character in the film. I find him the most interesting. Um, I think he's got the strongest character arc. I do kind of like it how it starts with him and kind of ends with him. It's kind of, I remember watching it for the first time, thinking, where where's this going? Mm. Uh, with all the twists and turns. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you brought up about the comparison to Thomas Millian because when 
88 released this film right here this was kind of my first real dive in past the dollars and once upon a time in the west films and i've always really liked tony mazanti um i've got to say i, I did think when i originally first watched it i thought people was calling him paco raban it took me a while to yeah. to, to get, <laughs> get the hang of his name thought, yeah yeah but i uh, yeah, I just love his look. I love it how he's got, you know, he's he's starting off in almost kind of sandals and then he's got one yeah. boot on, he's stolen from the army and one shoe. He's just a right scruff pot. But I think he's really, mm. really likeable. Um, but brilliant job by Tony Mazzanti is what I think of him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the movie, even though Franco Nero is the star power and his name is on top of uh, the main lead, it is kind of... Tony Masanti's uh, character, Paco's uh, story as the movie goes along, uh, um, which makes the movie, yeah. his yeah. journey from becoming a peasant to this Mexican revolutionary uh, leader, because he likes the idea of kind of uh, saving Mexico and sort of uh, being for the people. Um, so I thought he'd done an, a really amazing job um, in his only spaghetti western i would have liked to have seen more um has got a very similar look to uh thomas millian and i thought he's done a, a great job um the next character i want to bring up is jack palance um who plays kind of like the camp um <laughs> the camp uh, mercenary um so he, he he becomes uh involved in the story because at first he's after this uh this load of silver that's supposedly supposed to be uh in this mine but then obviously he gets embarrassed by paco and his gang so he becomes it kind of like his mission that he wants to go after him uh he goes by the name of curly um and funny enough yeah and, and funny enough uh jack palance uh, many years later in 1991 mm. after he'd been nominated i think uh, two years two twice before for best supporting actor he got the best supporting actor uh, award in city slickers with really crystal uh, playing yeah. a character by the name of uh curly curly as well yeah is, uh, yeah a great sort of uh, uh achievement and probably reference to the character he played in the mercenary so guys what did you think of jack palance jeff oh absolutely love him absolutely adore and love uh, jack palance in this film and also he would turn up as well in the company it was a few years later but mm. um yeah i think jack palance is, is, is amazing as he, he, he's always been an excellent villain and and, and films and even the occasional good good guys played the, those roles as well, but you know, mostly a villain. Uh, you know, my earliest memory of Jack Palance is uh, Tango and Cash, where he played the villain in, in mm. that film with Stallone and Kurt Russell. Uh, so I, I've always seen him as a villain. He's always been a great, lovable uh, villain. You know, a villain you you always you know sort of love to hate. Uh, yeah, I think he does a great job in this film, and I also love his little character touches. Like he appears to be a bit on the religious side. Like every time they sort of ride mm. away on the horses you know there's a crucifix or whatever he always has to do a you know sort of crossing um so i, I did like that aspect of the character obviously he's, all, he's also the only character in this film that has a nude scene as well which was very surprising to see like he's mm. pretty much fully naked in one scene uh which i think we might talk about when we talk about some of the favorite scenes and stuff but um yeah jack palance great villain great character as curly and yeah like you said it was very fitting that he would win the oscar uh, a few decades later for playing an, uh, another character called curly in a great film city mm -hmm. slippers yeah so yeah, i love jack palance i absolutely love him yeah i have to agree i do like jack palance the first film i see him in was the professionals uh, one of my mm -hmm. favorite westerns um in this film my only disappointment was that he wasn't in it more yeah. because i just yeah. think he, he's one of them that's just got the villainous face so you could watch a film with the with the sound off and think that's the villain right there um yeah i mean the religious side i did like the that kind of element to him and i was actually 
uh, without any spoilers, the kind of final scene, I actually thought he was going to do the old thing again, but he doesn't quite make it. Um, But yeah, other than the dodgy dodgy perm, absolutely great, great character. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I've I've got to agree with what Dan says. For me, re-watching it uh, just before this review, I realised it even more that he's not in it that that much, uh, which is a shame, really, because mm. it's a quite a major feat for an Italian director to get an actor like um, Jack Palance, uh, considering all the movies that he'd done before going into this, to to a, appear in a European Western. Um, I think a lot of the scenes that he pops up in, he he really does command the scene. Um, some great scenes w- with him. Uh, I actually like the look of him, um, even though he's got a dodgy perm. Um, and I didn't realise his campiness until, obviously, when he got embarrassed and one of his men, Sebastian, got taken out. And then you realise that he's not a straight... Uh, He's not a straight man or straight mercenary, mm. which for that sort of period, they didn't sort of put it in your face. It's kind of, you pick up on it. Yeah, it's more subtle. Um, yeah, subtle. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite subtle. Um, yeah. And then I think, you know, two years later, obviously with the Componeros movie, they made him a little bit more comedic in that one um and i thought his his, his character in that was just as good but yeah jack palance yeah. is probably one of the big pluses to this movie he brings a lot uh, it's like dan says you've only got to see that face and you know he's the villain um yeah i don't think i've seen that many movies of him playing the good guy uh main lead so jack palance was i thought he was fantastic in um in the mercenary um Definitely let me go on to yeah. then we go on to uh the last kind of uh, supporting uh, one of the main supporting actors is the colonel uh, played what eduardo vajardo who plays yeah. alfonso garcia he's made uh, he's, he's appeared in many many spaghetti westerns um yeah, and a few Jeff, friends, uh, Corbucci, uh, collaborated yeah, what did as you well. Think? Um, yeah, I, 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 people that you know watch my channel, you know, they know I, de- I dedicated a summer to uh, Corbucci film, the review of Corbucci film, Eduardo Fajardo. He's one of the sort of actors that really appears in a lot of Corbucci films, and he he was in Django, this one. Uh, I think he also was in Compañeros, but uh, that's only if you watch the full Uncut. Yeah, yeah smaller part. There. Yeah. Um, at what if we are I, I think there's only like one or two spaghetti westerns that i can think of at the, at the moment where he plays a good guy other than that he's always been the villain hmm. or or supporting villain or whatever sort of like a henchman but usually a main villain uh, and he just has the face for it, just like jack balance he just has the face for it and he always makes for a uh, very interesting villain and he doesn't have quite as much to do in this one as you know Django, for example but uh, for what he does, I think, yeah, it's just always great as a Spaghetti Western fan to, to see him in, in one of these films. Uh, I think, he, he, again, he, he does a pretty good job as the uh, sort of secondary uh, of villain. Because I, I do think that Jack Palance is sort of more of the, uh, the main villain of the piece. But yeah, I, I think Eduardo Friado does a good job as well. So, yeah. Dan? Yeah, I was trying to think of how I could sum him up, um, kind of, because... I've recognised him for a few films, and I looked at him and thought, yeah, you know, and I'm looking back and thinking of this. And the best way I can put it is I just think he's believable. He just seems to slot right into what he plays, especially as, as this. You, you just believe him in the role. And I can't say, you know, I'm a massive fan, but if he's in a spaghetti western, you're going to say, you know, he's going to make that part his own. He's going to make it better, a bit more believable. But... I haven't really got a lot to say about him in this film because he, other than being kind of the gem, he hasn't, wasn't in it a lot, yeah. much like yeah. Jack Palance. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the villains wasn't as present as you would think going into it, even yeah. though when they're there, it makes for good entertainment. That's me on that. 
Yeah, very true. Yeah, and Juan Friari is definitely one of those character actors in spaghetti westerns. So you might not know the name, you know, at first, yeah. but you definitely recognize the face whenever he pops up. So he's he's been in tons of spaghetti westerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, he's he's been in more spaghetti westerns than Franco Nero, and yeah. you know, him being, I mean, he was a Spanish actor who'd done a lot of westerns. Um, obviously, Django. A lot of people would have remembered him as Jackson in that one. Uh, it was he was also in Compañeros in a lot smaller role. Um, he would normally play the general or a Mexican bandit. Usually, he did do yeah. a. He was in a uh, Anthony Stephens spaghetti western named Gentleman Killer, where he played this Mexican bandit with this great big Mexican hat. That's yeah. probably one of my favorite roles uh that he he was in um but like dan says he's very you know he slots in perfectly um he, he doesn't look out of place and he looks believable you know he, even his look um some comedic moments uh, obviously he becomes more kind of gung-ho that he wants to bring down uh Paco's uh, revolutionary gang because after a few escapes each time he comes back with his army he comes back with a bigger yeah a bigger set of uh, men uh, the weaponry goes up a lot more because it kind of gets uh, annoying for him and embarrassing for him yeah that you know Franco Nero and Masanti's character keeps uh, escaping um but again yeah, like, even, know, even to the point by the end he, he gets a full you know freaking airplane uh, in there as well yeah <laughs> yeah which was actually uh jack palance uh, curly's idea where they get this uh this plane that's trying to sort of gun them down and sort of tracking them down uh, in, in one scene towards the end uh, yeah. but yeah eduardo fajardo always a reliable uh, sort of actor very similar to fernando sancho if you didn't have yeah. eduardo fajardo you'd have fernando sancho as kind of the general yeah. or the villain so they those two actors uh you know you you add up all their spaghetti westerns that they would have appeared in a lot in very similar well, roles at least 40 to 50 spaghetti westerns mm. between them yeah and the last um, main character actually a female character yeah. played and uh, by well. yeah. an, uh, an italian actress giovanni uh, reali who plays colombia who she kind of becomes um the helping hand for paco's uh, gang and kind of makes him switch to kind of becoming this uh mexican sort of revolution leader uh, he kind of listens to her uh, as the film goes along and for once in a spaghetti western we actually have a strong female uh, character which up until you know 1968 a lot of the women in spaghetti westerns were kind of beat up uh, whores or you know they were kind of violently abused on, on camera so going into this seeing seeing this character develop i thought uh giovanni reali was something different in a corbucci western putting over a woman in quite a, you know in, in a quite a important role so what did you think of uh, her character played by gianni giovanni uh reali hope i haven't butchered that name <laughs> No, that's okay. I, I should add, we should segue into this because we're going to give the women, especially strong characters in the West, we're going to give them their own segment. So we call this segment Women of the West. Women of the West. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, just and to pick up on what, just to pick up on what you said there, uh, Carlos. That is her uh, on the bottom right, isn't it? We that one, that was her on the bottom right. Obviously, I had to add her as one of the uh, women there in the collage, yeah. Uh, just to pick up on what you said there about Corbucci uh, in this film in particular, having a strong female character. I think Corbucci is one of the sort of pioneers of strong female characters in Westerns mm -hmm. to begin with. Because even if you look at um, Django from 66, Maria, uh, yes, yeah, she was a war character in that one but she, she still had a very strong presence and she still carried some weight into the story 
Um, I think Corbucci always had uh, strong female characters in his movies, you know, uh, Django, uh, The Mercenary, this one, uh, Navajo with Joe as well, and also in uh, The Hellbenders is a very strong female character in that one as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, Corbucci sort of always, and of course, you know, The Great Silence, I think, is the, the pinnacle of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Giovanna, uh, Giovanna, where are you? Yeah, Giovanna Rally. That's, yeah. That's a, diff a difficult name. Uh, Giovanna Rally, I think she does a, a great job, and she's uh, very good looking. Um, she plays the scenes very well. She has a you know good part to play. She uh, yeah, she becomes sort of an influence on uh, Tony Masanti's character. His actions are sort of influence you know through her. Uh, and through the relationship that they built together in the, in, in the movie, I think it's uh, it's a good part. I think she plays it you know, wonderfully, and she's uh, not bad to look at either, which uh, which doesn't hurt. Um, so I absolutely love Giovanna Rally again. I, uh, next to uh, you know the other main characters in this, like Franco Nero and uh, Tony Masanti, she's a definite, and Jack Palance, she's a definite uh, highlight of the film for me. Yeah, I thought I think she's absolutely great in it. And for me, the first time of watching this, it was really refreshing because I kind of wince when you get a Western of kind of this period because you just think you're waiting for the woman to get slapped, get beaten. I don't like that kind of thing. So when I see her and I see kind of how prominent she was in this film, the voice of reason uh, for, you know, as she looks, she's absolutely gorgeous. I've got to add, you just... You don't see that coming from her from when she's freed from the jail cell to kind of how important she is. She's almost like the right-hand person. Mm. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it sort of becomes that, yeah. For me, it, it, was, it was so refreshing, and I, I think she is fantastic in it. And uh, the, the actual picture you've got there you showed is very iconic as well, I've got to add. I think she's, um, yeah, yeah abs absolutely, absolutely yeah. brilliant. That's me on Giovanni Raleigh. Yeah. Yeah. I think watching this probably for the first time, when you actually see her, obviously she's very eye catching. Uh, she's beautiful to look at. Um, you sort of do think, is she just going to be eye candy that's just going to be placed in the background? Uh, but she is uh, She is more than that as, as the movie goes along, which I think she comes into it. Yeah in the last sort of two thirds of the movie. Um, I don't I don't know a lot of her. I mean, I know she did appear in another Western with George Peppard, Canon for Cordoba. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Which I know about, but do not have in my collection. Um, I've also seen her recently in a, in a Giallo uh, by Enzo Costello. I forgot the name of her. I think okay. it was Cold Eyes of Fear. I think she was in that as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. I Yeah, I, I probably might hunt that Western down. Just because, uh, obviously, you know, George Peppard, I uh, like to see him in the Western, yeah. but obviously, yeah. I think it was actually filmed in, in Europe. So, uh, I mean, she was I think it's Italian a Euro actress. Western, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was an Italian actress, so I definitely would be looking out for that one um, mm -hmm. because she was definitely uh, good to look at. Um, so now we uh, go on to the... Uh, Director Sergio Corbucci. So we're going behind the camera and we have a little mm. segment for that as well. Behind the camera. Yeah, Sergio, Sergio Corbucci. Uh, probably known as the, the second Sergio in the. The second the Sergio or the wrong Sergio as well, but he's been yeah. that by uh, Bird Reynolds. <laughs> Famous yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, <laughs> this uh, obviously this movie is a lot different. Obviously, how uh, Corbucci started his his earlier westerns were kind of more American type spaghetti westerns, but then all of a sudden yeah. he came out with the Django hit in '66, and that was all blood and guts and torture. But then he started, at this time in his career, he started to do the uh, Mexican Revolution uh, Spaghetti Westerns. So guys, what did you think of Corbucci's work up until uh, this movie and the quality of this movie? 
Um, yeah, for yeah. me, I, I think it's obvious because, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I did, you know, two years ago, I think at this point, I did a sort of whole tribute to Kobuchi where I did review every single one of his uh, spaghetti westerns. Uh, all 13 of them, if I remember, if I remember correct, I think he did 13 in, in total. Um, I absolutely love his body of work, and uh, yeah, as many people always say, like there's Sergio Leone, and then there's you know Sergio Corbucci. He's definitely the second Sergio. The uh, well, he's not the wrong Sergio, as Bert Reynolds called him, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a great uh, director, Sergio Corbucci. Uh, other than his westerns, he did a lot of you know Italian comedies, which I'm not the biggest fan of. So yeah. it's really his 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 western filmography that really makes it for me. Um, but especially with this one, the mercenary, you know, is all of his previous ones, like his first two or three westerns, they were more American feeling. I think with Minnesota Clay, uh, it's a, sort of started to be more Italian, even though that one still had a lot of American influences. But you know, then '66 we had Navo, Joe, and Django, and the Hellbenders, I think, was '66 as well, or, or maybe that was '67. Maybe that was in between. Yeah. Um, with those films, he definitely made it more of his own. And sort of different, uh, differentiate, I think, is that yeah, that's the word himself from uh, the other Sergio from uh, Leone. But with this one, I feel he, tr he tried to be more Leone esque, especially with some of the more epic shots and scenes in this film. Mm. Uh, like, for example, we're going to talk about it, but when we get to the final sort of showdown, that's about as Leone esque as you're going to get with uh, yeah. Gucci. Uh, especially with the uh, Ennio Morricone music, which again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but overall, his body of work, I think, is fantastic, especially his films right up until 1970. I feel like after that, it's sort of last three, uh, two or three spaghetti westerns that were a bit, you know, sort of lesser films. Uh, I did like Sonny and Jet, that was one of his last films. I did like that film. Um, but yeah, I love his spaghetti western um, catalog, I guess. And I think uh, he's definitely uh, one of the best directors of the genre. And he, did a fantastic job with this film. Yeah, for me, um, other than Leone, he's always, I know I'm going to get of what I've seen, um, a very good spaghetti western. And I said to Jeff before we recorded this, I watched this film originally straight after Django, and I really wasn't a fan of it originally just because it was so different. Uh, a lot more tame. Um, but re watching it in recent years, I've come to really like it. And I kind of put it in a way that it's a western, a spaghetti western that puts a smile on my face um, because mm. it's got it's got the bit of humour in it. Uh, so I love I love Paco. He makes me laugh. And yeah, I have to agree. Then the only kind of shots Kabuchi went with, I actually thought lent lent to it. Um, it was bigger budget, if I'm not mistaken. Hence the aeroplane. I was watching it. It's a good kind of fan made documentary on this eighty eight disc. Um, Sort of something that if you have, even if you have horses in a spaghetti western, sometimes you've got a budget, let alone a, let alone a plane. Yeah. And yeah, I've got to say, it's it's definitely possibly in my top three Kabuchi films now, um, just because it's it's different. I mean, Django's going to still be better for me, but yeah, if you want something different, this one, I, I do like Kabuchi style with this. That's a fair point, actually. I think I had Mercenary at my number three Corbucci uh, film. I think that was my number three in my ranking. So it's a, it's a great one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, you know, on Corbucci's Westerns, I would say, obviously, if you love the uh, Leone movies, obviously give Sergio Corbucci movies a shot. And I would say the peak of his career were the movies that he made from 66 to 1970 even though a little bit after he made one or two good ones he did kind of go more into that sort of comedy family orientated uh, movies but for me where he made his name was kind of like the high violence uh in spaghetti westerns where leone was a little bit more artistic more stylish, and yeah. More stylish, yeah. and he had the budget. Obviously, Corbucci didn't have that to compete with. Uh, he just ramped it up with the violence, becoming a little bit more controversial with uh, other movies before. Um, so, you know, 
Guibucci is definitely a uh, great director in this uh, genre for me. And uh, yeah, I mean, the work on this one is like Dan says, uh, you know, if if you do have a plane in this and you do have horses, uh, it's considered high budget. Even the uh, trains as well and a, and a railway yeah. track and, and stuff, that, that could sort of be considered... Um, one of the tropes in, in a more high budget spaghetti western than, than normal so Colbucci definitely went kind of a little bit all out even all that. vintage cars actually just just came to be even yeah like yeah i mean film as well. yeah. yeah i mean this movie was set during the mexican revolution uh yeah, the 19... early 1900s what is it yeah yeah 1910, so 1911. Yeah. you will see a few cars in this one uh and also as dan um spotted uh, a HMV sign in the background, mm. which I never realised until I, I watched the finale uh, scene. So, guys, you know, obviously look out for that. So, we uh, go into the next section of this uh, episode, and um, it will be favourite scenes in yeah. in this movie. Uh, Jeff, what would be some Favorite scenes. We gotta set it up, Carlos. <laughs> so yeah, favorite scenes. Um, so you want me to go on this one first, then, Carlos? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, the, the obvious, biggest one, uh, the best scene for me. It's hands down the, uh, the final showdown. Or yeah, it, it is a final showdown. There's stuff that happens afterwards, but for you know all you know, intents and purposes, it's sort of the uh, the big showdown, the piece, the big, the big climax um we're not going to spoil too much but we're in a in a bull ring bull arena and uh yeah we it's from the scene where uh, tony Massanti is dressed up as a, as a rodeo clown and you know he's got the clown makeup on and everything and uh it's sort of similar to for a few dollars more the the duel where it's a it's a freeway but it's not sort of uh we're free participants we have mm -hmm. one character as sort of the referee acting between the other two participants of the, of the duo uh yeah the music in that again we're going to get to that but awesome awesome music awesome. like i said that's about as leone as you're going to get in this film or pretty much in any of the Kabuchi films um where that's really sort of Kabuchi's version of a leone um showdown of a, of a duo uh so that's hands down my favorite scene uh again not going to spoil too much if you guys haven't seen it watch it for this scene alone this is absolutely worth uh, watching the film for as the final uh, showdown. Other than that, yeah, I love all the uh, other action uh, set pieces, spectacle. I mean, we mentioned, you know, there's a car and there's Gatling gun scenes, there's an airplane, a lot of high action in this one. Uh, really great. You can definitely tell it had a good budget because there's some absolute spectacle put into the action scenes. Uh, some more quieter scenes that I like as well were. Um, yeah, we're sort of the scene where Tony Massanti has a change of heart and he looks at the map of Mexico. I like the dialogue yeah. where he says, like, look at it, Gringo. It's Mexico. I never knew it was so big. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, <laughs> I do like that scene, uh, more, more of a choir scene. Uh, the scene where Jack Palance gets sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Humil humiliated. Um, and yeah, they tell him to uh, strip down to his bare ass, <laughs> pretty much. And he just walks up into the distance and they uh, show his, you know, naked body walking up into this. I thought that was a funny scene. Uh, some other funny scenes, yeah, we mentioned Frank Renero using the, the matches uh, and pretty much every surface he can find. He, he, he strikes the match between the, uh, the woman's uh, cleavage. Uh, he strikes a match between a guy's teeth. I mean, he, he gets very creative with, with his match uh, striking. Uh, so yeah, we, we had some fantastic scenes in this uh, film. So those are just some of my favorite. I, lo I like the funny ones. I love the action scenes, but my favorite has got to be that uh, final duo. So what do you think, Dan? What were some of your yeah. favorite scenes? Yeah, I'll point out another two or three as you, you've mentioned them. So I do love kind of the introduction to kind of Franco Nero where the guy's gambling and he makes him drink the milk and the dice. Well, there's any people holds his pistol up and tips the milk down i think you've got to see it to understand what i mean but then mm. I, I do love the scene when they first come across the uh machine gun and 
Flacco, doesn't know how to use it, and then Franco Nero does, and he said it's two hundred dollars. He sets it up, and he doesn't know how to shoot it, and he said he looks at um Polak and says, "Do you know how to shoot it? Yeah, but it's going to cost you two hundred dollars to shoot yeah. it." I just think that's, uh, but that's when you kind of realise how much of an arsehole Franco Nero's Polak character is. Um, and I also really like the scene of um, when they're kind of in, what would you call it, like um, the guest house, really, where uh, Paco thinks that um, Colombia is going to go to bed with Franco Nero. He comes yeah. running up the stairs and then he jumps out the window and yeah, all the pig shit. Team. I think that's yeah. great. And then you finally see Franco Nero's character get actually dirty in that scene. And I thought that was that that was needed. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with them three. I'll let you go with some of yours, Carlos. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, straight straight off, uh, the the showdown scene in the bull ring is, is a memorable one. Um, for another reason, which we'll get into. Um, yeah, very similar to for a few dollars more. Uh, again, me saying if you love the uh, Sergio Leone spaghetti westerns, then this one is definitely a must. Um, I agree with what Dan said um, when the Colonel's army they come looking for Paco's gang, and they've you know he's arrived at the mine. Uh, which was his own property and this time he's come there with force and obviously Paco's men are kind of fighting it, fighting for their lives really and uh, the machine gun gets used which uh, Paco has a real trouble kind of uh, setting it up and uh, where Franco Nero's character is just kind of just watching and uh, Obviously, Paco can't set the gun off, and uh, they kind of negotiate a deal while bullets are being being fired and bombs are getting dropped. Uh, I, I thought that's quite a comical scene. But twice during that sort of uh, gun battle, they, they were negotiating a deal where Santi's character, Paco, is literally throwing hundreds of dollars at uh, Sergei Kalowski to sort of help him get out of the situation. I think it was a fun scene, but at the same time, it's quite violent. Um, I also like a few times where Paco's uh, kind of, he thinks he can go on his own. And uh, each time he kind of fails, a few times he fails miserably. And then there's one scene where he's got... Um, so a guy uh, kind of chained up and doesn't really yeah. want his services and uh, obviously the last shootout then he realises that uh, the colonels and, and Curly are now approaching with extra firepower to bring them in uh, and then he's in real trouble after getting married with uh, Columbia now he's in real Sort of trouble in, in getting out of another sticky sort of uh, position. He's again hiring the services of uh, Franco Nero uh, again. So yeah, some some great scenes there uh, in, in, in the mercenary for sure. Um, I think next we'll talk about the Tarantino uh, homage references that he used. Uh, in several scenes in this movie, into Tarantino's movies, uh, yeah. Jeff and uh, Dan, what you what you want to say about Tarantino using, uh, you know, the certain scenes that he did? Yeah, this was definitely a uh, influential film for Tarantino in a lot of ways. Uh, I think even uh, he has once, you know, said as the top twenty spaghetti westerns, this, this was one of them. Um, so Tarantino uh, clearly loves this film, but yeah, it's uh, the sort of references that he has to this film. It starts all the way with uh, with the Kill Bill films, and it's, uh, in particular Kill Bill Two, where Judas is the uh, the big piece of the soundtrack from this film for one of the pivotal scenes there. Um, you know, the scene where Uma Thurman as the bride is punching her way out, out the coffin when she's been buried alive by uh, Michael Madsen's character. Uh, that music that plays there is from this film. Uh, so guys, if you're wondering uh, what that piece of music was, it's from this. Um, 
also in Inglorious Bastards, that he uses the uh, a couple of the themes, uh, the, the main theme from this as well. Uh, so yeah, this was definitely a highly influential film uh, for Tarantino, and there's a even a visual homage um, to this film. Where I'm not going to spoil it too much, with uh, in Django Unchained with the Calvin Candy character played by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, there's uh, a visual reference there we're seeing to this movie with Jack Balance uh, and his character. So definitely an influential film for Tarantino. He, he clearly loves this film. So. Yeah, um, I do love Tarantino references. It always, even if I haven't seen a film he's referencing, I'll go back and watch it. It was funny because yesterday night, as you sort of browsing YouTube, I actually watched, I, I've been getting into Lady Snowblood and Shogun Assassin and seeing the references kind of Tarantino makes and then kind of the references he makes to Spaghetti Westerns and even down to the list yeah. that... Um, Kowalski's making in this, which you've got to point out with a list when he's crossing it off in this film, That's it's just such one. another really yeah. cool scene. Um, yeah. yeah, I was gonna gonna jump in, but I didn't want to interrupt you, Carlos. When in negotiating about using the gun, how cool the character is. He's just like everyone's getting shot and he's just so so cool. But yeah, my, my personal favourite reference is obviously in the final showdown. Um, Tarantino uses in Django Unchained again we can't say it because it spoil it but everyone if you've seen Django Unchained and then you watch this The Mercenary you will realise the reference but yeah I love Tarantino references that we spoke about on another stream um, I think it's yeah, paying yeah. great homage yeah. to, to yeah. legends of, of, of the kind of film industry and just on a yeah. personal note for me you know when I was a kid I knew oh, okay. I was a little bit older than a kid, but uh, when I was a little bit, you know, younger than I am now, I should say, uh, when I watched the uh, Tarantino films, uh, some of them I watched before, you know, Spaghetti Wars, like this one, for example, and I was like, hey, that music is cool, and I listened to the soundtrack from the from the Tarantino films, and then finally, you know, after a few years, I watched, you know, for example, this one, The Mercenary, and I was like, hey, that's the music from when yeah. Uma Thurman is, you know, getting out of the coffin. Yeah. And, I don't know, I just really love that when, when he does it. I really don't have anything yeah. against uh, Tarantino's homages and stuff. I, uh, he, he can do it a bit too much. Again, we, we talked about this on a different story. Yeah. Um, but overall, I, I, I never really had too much of a problem with uh, with the homages. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I have sort of have said on that Tarantino uh, live stream that we did that sometimes Tarantino can overdo it. And... Even though he's used quite a few from this movie, I still enjoyed them. I, I really did. Um, and it's quite obvious that Corbucci is one of his uh, favourite directors. Uh, you know, he made a documentary about him and possibly going to be writing yeah. a book. But um, I thought he used them nicely in, in Tarantino's movies, the, the references. Um, they were kind of a lot sort of like nods to this movie uh, i think probably he's used more from this movie than even django uh if, if in my opinion or just as just as many so yeah, uh, yeah there, there's definitely yeah. there's definitely a, a big homage to uh tarantino's movies uh in this one the mercenary uh directed by sergio cabucci so guys i mean how would you rate this movie? Uh, what would we rate them out of cowboy hats? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, cowboy hats. Yeah. But I think there's one more thing we uh, we should talk about before we go into the final. Uh, oh, we need to um, rating. We, we we haven't talked about the big, uh, you know, sort of elephant in the room, which is the, uh, the amazing score by Ennio Morricone, and of course yeah. we have a little clip to set, set that up as well. So let's quickly play that and talk about it. The music. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to say we're going to, this speech will probably be under good points and bad points, uh, if there's any about this movie. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, the music definitely deserves a mention on its own for this one because yeah. it is the maestro. It is, you know, in my yeah. opinion, the greatest composer who ever, who ever lived. It is Ennio Morricone. And uh, yeah, for me, this is one of his all-time best scores, in particular the uh, the track La Arena, which, uh, as we mentioned, plays plays during the uh, the final showdown in this film. 
which is a fantastic piece of music. Oh, yeah, there we go. Carlos has the, uh, the soundtrack for it. That's one of the few soundtracks of his that I still need to get on, uh, on CD myself. I still need to get that. Yeah, absolutely fantastic soundtrack from the main theme, the uh, sort of more of the Mexican, you know, folk sort of music, whatever it is, whatever you want to describe it. Uh, even to the the whistling in this, I think is absolutely amazing. I, I try to replicate or sort of redo the whistling, but it, it's impossible for me. I, I'm quite a good whistler, but I can't I cannot whistle this main theme. But uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic uh, soundtrack for me. It's uh, one of his greatest, and you know, it should even be you know worth mentioning, or it should be should be said that this was in 1968, which was probably the busiest year for Morricone. He did I think 12 Western scores in this year alone. You know, one of them is Once One Time in the West. Um, and the other one was was Great Silence as well, was this year. It was also 68. So yeah, it's, it's quite a busy year for Morricone, and he still was able to deliver so many diverse scores for each of, the, of these Westerns. I, I think it's a feat that really should be celebrated. So, yeah, great score. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, so it says something when i go out my way to buy a cd soundtrack but cd soundtracks i bought in the last few years all Ennio morricone it kind of annoys me a little bit when i talk to people who i call a bit more of a casual film fan when they say john williams or hans zimmer and they don't know who Ennio morricone is but i'm with you jeff i do think he's the greatest uh when whenever you see his name on the back cover or music by Ennio morricone you, you kind of know what well, at least the music's going to be very very good and he's got the knack of absolutely fitting the music to kind of every scene and every mood um for me i just think it's it's incredible um the best for me yeah so i mean the music i mean this kind of nicely leads into uh, a section in this review or episode uh good points and bad points uh, the music is one of the other good points of the movie um you've got some great mexican sort of music and you've got some great dual music uh i also like curly's theme every time he pops up um, that's oh, a little yeah. nice little tune that he every time he pops up to, in in every scene um but yeah we've got to re also remember that although morricone takes the main credit for the soundtrack it was actually also Bruno Nicolai as well. Um, he yeah, added, they did work added, together on this. Yeah. He also added in this in, in, into this uh, soundtrack, um, um, and it's definitely up there with some of uh, Morricone's best work in, in scores for me. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the good points. Uh, also. Uh, for me, good points to the movie is, is the strong cast, which uh, I think we could all agree on uh, each actor and actress had a credible uh, piece in the movie. Um, I also like the action scenes. They are quite sort of, they have that more higher budget look to a spaghetti western. They're nicely done with the machine gun scenes. Uh, and even the humor as well it's uh it's not overdone uh, so i think you've got a good balance of sort of violence and 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 sort of light-hearted comedy without being too silly which a lot of the spaghetti western did kind of more 1970s uh, on onwards so for me that that is some of the good points of this uh movie the mercenary so jeff if you could let me know some of your good points about this movie. Um, good points. Um, well, I think you pretty much covered them all. I mean, it has a uh, terrific cast for me. I love all these sort of main, uh, you know, characters and actors in this film and actresses. Um, it has an amazing score. Um, the cinematography, I think, is, is really great and epic. And it has an epic scale to it, as we talked about with the action scenes and stuff. Um, I think um, maybe if there's a sort of bad point for it, because I'm going to talk about the bad points as well. It, not that there are many, uh, should be added, but uh, I think it's uh, the same sort of issue I had with uh, the movie we talked about in the previous episode, The Magnificent Seven. I think it's the pacing. Um, sort of, it's a little slightly too long in certain, certain scenes. Uh, 
could have been trimmed a bit, but that's really the only negative that I can really uh, add for this for this film. Overall, I am pretty much all positive on this one. Uh, there's not too many uh, bad points for me. Pretty much is. 95 to 99% of the film is all good points for me. It's like it's just a 1% of the pacing that uh, drags it a bit down for me. Um, but overall, I think it's just an excellent film. Uh, plenty of good points. Um, but yeah, the strongest one has got to be the, the great sort of group of actors, great cast, and the, uh, the amazing music and the great scope of the film. So yeah. Yeah. I actually don't have a weak point for this film. This, so the first time I watched it, I thought, oh, Jack Palance could have been in it a bit more. Going into it again, I thought I knew what to expect. But I, I'm actually going to really differ from you on this one, Jeff, because a mental note I took on this is I actually think the pacing is really, really good in this. For a film of like what, mm. an hour, hour 40 minutes, um, it flew by for me. Um and I, I was thinking at some parts, maybe it's quite fast paced. So for someone who's going in and don't want a Western to drag, just an easy watch, which is a great mix of action, humor, fantastic characters that really fit the role, the people playing them fit the role brilliantly. Even though this is, there's, there's far better spaghetti Westerns, say a handful at least. Um, I don't really have a negative to say about this. I've really enjoyed it this time. Originally, I didn't too much, but yeah, I just had such a great time this time around. Um, yeah, to I be fair, got... uh, sorry, Carlos. Yeah, to be fair, um, I should say that this is um, something I only notice on this viewing. I mean, I've, I've probably watched this film about 10 to 15 times or whatever. Uh, and it's only like on this most recent one that I sort of found it a bit dragging at some part. So it might be just because of this viewing. I never really saw that this criticism before. I, I should just add that. But yeah, overall, yeah. other than that, I do agree with you, Dan. In some parts, it just flies by, especially in the action scene yeah. and the end set pieces and stuff. But uh, I just want to add that. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, Carlos, carry on. <laughs> I don't have too many bad points. I mean, if, if they're only slight bad points. Uh, Jack Palance's character Curly could have been in it a little bit more for me. That's because I liked uh, the character. Um, I've never had an issue with the pacing. If anything, I would have wanted another 15, 20 yeah. minutes. Uh, but then that, that is maybe me and maybe I'm being biased because I do like my Westerns to be around the two hour mark. Um, yeah. The, the only slight criticism is maybe that some of the twists and turns happened a little bit too often and too rapidly uh, for my liking. Mm. Uh, also, when Paco and Colombia, they kind of get married. And then just after they get married, uh, you've got the army coming after them. So they could have added a little bit more on that for me. Um, but like as Dan says, you know, on the flip side, if you just kind of want a fast moving hour and 45 minutes Western, this would be ideal because, you know, there are a few out there that don't like the kind of uh, two to two and a half hours uh, running time for a Western. So it worked for me uh, either way. So that kind of would lead into our next bit, how we rate and rank this movie uh jeff yeah i should add aka also known as the review roundup i've called this segment so the review roundup in which we will give our final sort of thoughts and rating and so yeah as we talked about it's only on this recent viewing that i sort of felt in certain scenes uh like Get back into the action get back into the action sort of felt some of the more dialogue scenes i guess uh this time around were a bit more dragging for me but uh i, I do agree like i would have loved to have seen more of jack palance and uh, uh um uh, eduardo friardo sort of more of their villain uh, more the villains because they did feel a bit um what's the word uh, underused i guess um but still uh like i said they played great for some less but uh yeah, so overall final thoughts, I think it's a excellent uh, Western, an excellent spaghetti Western, an excellent film, uh, to be fair. 
And I think like if anybody is trying to get into the genre or in this sort of subgenre of spaghetti westerns, uh, it's one of the perfect places to start. Like if you've seen Leone's, if you've seen Django, uh, I would say throw this in next. Uh, it's definitely uh, one of the highlights of the genre. Tarantino has it in his top t 20 spaghetti westerns. I have it in my top 20 spaghetti westerns. And it's my third favorite Koguchi film uh, right after The Great Silence and Django. So it's, it's one of his all time best for me. And uh, yeah, I give this one uh, for doing a rating of cowboy hats again. Um, <laughs> what am I going to give that? I'll probably give it a uh, eight cowboy hats out of ten. Dad? Yeah, so me just to sum up uh, again, if someone wants a faster paced spaghetti western, in my opinion, that has a good mix of action. A few unforced laughs like you get in some of the more sillier spaghetti westerns later on with interesting characters some good twists and turns which originally i didn't see coming but i do kind of acknowledge that maybe they happen a bit too often but they're, they're still good um i think you would find it hard push to find a more enjoyable spaghetti western other than the usual kind of ones everyone mentions let's say the the great silence dollars trilogy django once upon a time in the west um i would give this a solid seven cowboy hats out of ten okay so i think we all enjoy western um yeah i mean i'll give it it's a it's a very good spaghetti western um i, I actually probably would watch this one a little bit more than django which may surprise you because i think django is a lot more darker and bleaker uh one with franco nero and this one's a little bit more light-hearted uh, i like the gunplay in this as well it looks a little bit more realistic you know with the machine gun scenes uh, more so than the django scenes and obviously the soundtrack for me is a lot better in this one than django but you know django is a lot more of a popular one because of uh, the main lead you know the stranger who walks in dragging a coffin but i would give this a, a very good uh, rating of eight cowboy hats out of ten it's uh, an essential one to uh, watch if you want to get into spaghetti westerns for me uh, you won't feel disappointed and i think all three of us recommend this uh spaghetti western the mercenary um Absolutely. so yeah. i'm just going to talk about some of the releases briefly then obviously i'll take it to dan and dan can kind of discuss his um choice because what we're doing is uh, obviously the first episode the magnificent seven was uh jeff's choice uh, and this episode it was uh, my choice of the mercenary so what's i just briefly mention that even though I've got the 88 films release, uh, you can say, pick I this have up. The, uh, I have the German one, yeah. Yeah, you can pick this up on the German release, which Jeff has, has got there, haven't you, Jeff? Yeah, with the Italian, which they call Mercenario, yeah. With the Italian title, from, uh, Mercenario, Bosch Media. Media. Yeah. That's the that's reverse art. So the 88. That's also the 88. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Kino in the in America have. Yeah. Kino has it in the US. Yeah. That, yeah. They have that cover. Uh, so it's a pretty affordable one to pick up on Blu ray. Uh, there's quite a few releases. Yeah. It's, of, it's definitely available in the multiple uh, regions, territories. It's, uh, it's, it's widely available. Yeah. And mm. uh, so that takes to dan and he's going to say his choice for our next episode on the westerns for life podcast drum roll yes episode three go on let's hear it so for episode three of the westerns for life podcast i've gone for 1962's the man who shot liberty valance uh which stars john wayne and james stewart won't say too much about it now, but I'm really looking forward to talking about this classic American Western with two greats in it. Well, more than two greats, Lee Marvin yeah, as well, yeah. Lee Van Cleef as well, yeah, Lee Van Cleef in the background. Yeah. So, guys, I think uh, that wraps it up for another episode of the uh, Westerns for Life uh, podcast. So, guys, stay tuned. 
for episode three upcoming, which is going to be the man who shot Liberty Valance. Anything else to say, guys? No, I think that's uh, no. about it. Just uh, thanks for watching, everyone, and stay tuned for the next one. Looking forward to the man who shot Liberty Valance, and uh, that's it for this one. Adios, compañeros. Yes, sir. death to the highest bidder. He'll sell your life for what he thinks it's worth. He is the mercenary. If you're not ready to buy, be ready to die. He aims for the money. His gun does the rest. Franco Nero. Tony Musanti. Jack Balance. Giovanna Rally. The mercenary. The sun at his back, a gun at his side, a town at his mercy.